Hey, so uh, welcome everyone to uh, this week's talk. We're very happy to have Jeremy Wood this, uh, this week. So Jeremy was previously an undergraduate student at the University of Cambridge. Um, he left to go to uh, TU Delft to his PhD with the East Van Gillip. Um, he is very shortly moving to the University of Bonn I think in January. Um, and he's going to talk to us today about joint reconstruction segmentation with graph PDEs. So thank you very much, Jeremy, and uh, over to you. Thank you, Matthew, and thank you for inviting me, and thank you all for coming along to this talk. See, I'm going to be talking about using um, graph PDE methods to perform joint reconstruction segmentation um, with image on images. Um, so this is joint work of myself and Yuen Hennep, um, but also um, Jonas Latz, who is in the audience, and then Simone Parasotto and Carola Schoenlieb at Cambridge. Um, so the basic thing I'm going to be talking about with this talk, we're going to start off with talking about what is um, image segmentation, what is joint reconstruction segmentation, then how we can use graph methods to implement, um, to perform joint reconstruction segmentation, then particularly talking about the algorithm that we have devised for doing joint reconstruction segmentation on graphs, and then finally talk about some preliminary results that we have using this method. Um, so first off, um, before we talk about reconstruction segmentation, what is segmentation? So segmentation is the task of splitting an image into its important features. Um, so here, for example, you can see an application where we are um, uh, identifying the spot on this bird's head. And so we're going to be representing this image by a function which sends the pixels of the image to um, some number of real values. And then we'll be focusing on binary segmentation. So we're finding a function which sends these pixels to either zero or one. And you can think about this as a learning problem where what we are trying to learn a labeling of the pixels of this image. And maybe we have some subset of this image are going to be training data pixels so that we already know the segmentation. And so then we'll be extending the labels from those training data pixels on to the entire image. But in practice, um, the images that we're going to be observing are going to be um, observed indirectly and going to be observed noisily. So what we're going to have is when you have these measurements y, which are generated by some transformation of our image x plus some noise, and then we want to reconstruct our image um, x and segment that reconstructed image. That's what we need to do in order to get to those um, segmentations. And so there are traditionally sort of two methods for um, performing this joint reconstruction segmentation task. Um, the traditional method is just do this in series. So that first you use some reconstruction method to, um, to reconstruct your image from your observations. And then you use some standard segmentation method to segment the image that you have reconstructed. Um, an alternative approach is what uh, um, these end-to-end -end methods that have become more popular with machine learning, especially, where instead we just have a load of um, pairs, perhaps, of um, observations and ground truth segmentations. And we just learn a map that will send observations directly to segmentations. So both of these methods have drawbacks. So the first method um, has to draw about isn't really using all of its information here, but the reconstruction doesn't know that it's trying to um, be followed by a segmentation and can't, and can't use any a priori information that you might have about that segmentation to aid the reconstruction. Um, Whilst with the end-to-end -end method, there are a number of things that can be a problem with this method. The, the mapping that you get is going to be a little bit of a black box, potentially. Um, you're going to potentially need a number of, of training data in, in order to perform um, this method. And it's not really using the fact that the um, thing that you want to segment is an image, which might be relatively well behaved. Um, whilst these observations might be a little bit um, more, um, well, less, less well structured. And of course, the other problem with this end to end method is that you don't actually get a reconstruction, at least not explicitly. Um, it might be sort of implicit in the way that this um, thing works. 
but you don't get a clear um, reconstruction. And so that can make it a bit harder to interpret the segmentation that you've gotten out um, at, the at the end. So, the, so joint reconstruction segmentation is trying to be in the middle between these two different um, extremes and is performing the reconstruction task and the segmentation task, segmentation task together and using one to aid the other in order to try and get both a reconstruction and a segmentation which is better than could have been gotten by doing either um, by themselves. And so this falls under a general category of task adapted reconstruction problems. And there's this uh, fa um, excellent paper by Adler et al, which gives a good overview of those task, adapt of task adapted reconstruction. So how are we going to do joint reconstruction segmentation? Well, what we're going to do is think about it in terms of this of a joint variation or scheme. So we've got this minimization problem um, at the top here, where we're simultaneously trying to minimize an energy which penalizes um, our the quality of our reconstruction and an energy which encourages our segmentation to be a good segmentation of that candidate reconstruction. And so in order to, to minimize this joint energy, we're going to apply an iterative scheme. So we're going to first hold fixed our candidate um, segmentation and then update our reconstruction based on that candidate segmentation, essentially using the segmentation energy here as an extra regularizer on our reconstruction problem. And then we will hold fixed our candidate segmentation um, reconstruction and update our segmentation to be a better segmentation of that reconstruction. And then we're also going to be adding sort of momentum terms here to aid with convergence. And so that is then the overarching method that we're going to be looking at for joint reconstruction segmentation. OK, now how are we going to do it, um, incorporate this into a graph framework? So the first thing that I'm going to be talking about here is how to do analysis on graphs and the framework for doing analysis on graphs. And then we need to think about how we're going to turn our image into a graph so that we can use these graph based methods to segment our image. Then we're going to be talking about the particularly the Ginsburg Landau based image segmentation methods that we're going to be using. Um, and then finally, how we can incorporate those methods into a joint reconstruction segmentation framework. OK, so what so how do we do analysis on graphs? So first off, our graphs, these are finite um, sets of vertices linked by edges. And then on each of these edges, we're putting a weight, which is sort of meant to indicate how similar these two um, vertices are meant to be. And then how do we do analysis? Well, we define a Hilbert space. So in particular, we're defining these Hilbert spaces on these vertex functions and on these edge functions with these following inner products. And you can see that these inner products are just the standard L2 inner product, but with a graph dependent scaling, um, either by a on each vertex or on each edge, depending on whether we're looking at edge functions or vertex functions. And then we can define variants of the gradient and the Laplacian on a graph um, as follows. Um, and so here, this Laplacian is the graph Laplacian that has been studied in combinatorics for uh, many decades. Um, and the, we've got this parameter R here. What that is encoding is the normalization of this Laplacian. Um, so when R is one, which it will be for, for the majority of this, um, for this talk, then we get a Laplacian called the random walk Laplacian. The, this normalization is actually quite important because part of the reason why these methods work is that the eigenvectors of the graph Laplacian turn out to be relatively good at segmenting an image. Um, but that only really works when you normalize these, um, when you normalize the graph Laplacian is when you get that really good segmentation based on the eigenvectors. And so for full details of, of this graph analysis framework, I refer you to Van Gennep et al. 2014. 
And then to turn an image into a graph, well, the first thing is um, what are the vertices of this graph? They are the pixels of this image. And then we need to build the, um, a function which tells us the weights on the edges of this graph. And the way that we do that is we compute feature vectors at each pixel of the image, which encodes sort of the key information about that pixel. And then we use these feature vectors to compute the edge weights via a function such as the one on the slide. And then we can summarize all of this as the application of an image to graph map, which sends an image to a weight matrix on the, um, the pixels of that image. And so the way um, the image to graph map that I've described on this slide isn't actually isn't the only way of doing things. Um, and there's there's quite a lot of work that's been done and even using sort of deep learning type methods for constructing this image to graph map. But we're going to be using a fairly simple map for the um, for the work in this talk. And part of the reason is that we will be wanting to use differentiability of this image to graph map. And in fact, we're going to be using the fact that this radial basis function has a fairly well behaved derivative in order to simplify things. Um, but in practice, you might be able to extend these methods um, with, to, to, to more general image to graph maps um, by thinking about how to, how to compute these derivatives. OK, so now that we've gotten our image and we've turned it into a graph, how are we going to segment that graph which represents our image? And the key idea of Batozzi Flanner 2012, which really kickstarted this particular uh, method, is to think about the Ginzburg Landau energy on a graph and, by, and minimize that to segment the image. So the Ginzburg Landau energy on a graph can be defined by the following expression, which contains these three different terms. So what this first term does is it penalizes your segmentation, um, putting two pixels into different segments if the edge weight between those pixels is quite high. Um, so it means that if these pixels are very similar to each other, then it encourages those to go into the same segment. Then the second term here uh, is using a double well potential to force your segmentation function to be a binary function, to take values 0 and, and 1. And then this final term here, as I mentioned, you have potentially some subset of your image is training data pixels for which you have an a priori segmentation f. And so this term is penalizing your segmentation for deviating from your a priori segmentation on that training data. And then this weight mu, which is um, only non-zero on the training data, is sort of encoding how confident you are in that labeling at that particular pixel in your training data. And then we minimize this Ginsburg-Landau energy via its allen kahn gradient flow, which is the following um, differential equation here. And so then how do we um, solve this differential equation? Well, we want to put some numerical scheme on it. And the numerical scheme that um, we have been studying is what we've been calling the semi-discrete implicit Euler scheme, or SDIE scheme. And so what this does here is that we can think of this equation as having two parts. We've got this part here involving the double well potential. And then we've got these other two parts which correspond to a fidelity force diffusion type process. So what we do for the SDIE scheme is that we um, use the exact solution operator for that fidelity force diffusion for a time step tau. And then we take an implicit Euler step in the double well potential term. And, uh, and then we add those together to get our update for our numerical scheme. And if you choose the double well potential to be a potential called the double obstacle potential, which is um, what that's defined as being is it's infinite outside of the wells and quadratic between them. Um, and then this we have to then incorporate a bunch of ideas from the subdifferential in order to make sense of this term here. That is an entirely separate talk. Um, but once you've done that and you've gone through all of the analysis, what you find is that the solution to the 
SCIE scheme is just this piecewise linear thresholding of the diffused state. And when this tau equals epsilon, what you get is this is just then a step function thresholding. And that and this process of fidelity force diffusion followed by step fr function thresholding is exactly the MBO scheme that was developed for graph image segmentation in Mercosia et al. in 2013. And so this is quite an efficient method because all you need to do is compute the fidelity force diffusion, and then you just get this um, piecewise linear thresholding for free in order to then update your Allen Kahn equation. Okay, so tying this all together, um, how do we do joint reconstruction segmentation on graphs? So first, just a little bit of notation. Um, we had been using X to represent the entire image. I'm now using X just to represent the bit of the image which isn't training data. And then we're going to assume that the training data bit of our image has been perfectly reconstructed and segmented. Um, a classic example of this will be, um, which is what we're going to use in, in the results at the end, where your training data pixels are an entirely separate image that you've already reconstructed and segmented. And then you're transferring the segmentation from that onto a new image that needs to be reconstruction segmented. Um, so then what we want to do in order to, um, to find our joint reconstruction segmentation is solve this joint variational problem. And so this is just comprised of two terms. This first term is the energy reconstruction that we had on the earlier slide. And this is the standard sort of ROF style um, variational image reconstruction energy where you've got some regularizer um, and then you've got a fidelity term to your measurements. And then the um, re segmentation energy is this Ginsburg-Landau energy that we have been minimizing via the Allen Kahn equation. Uh, but now on the graph generated using our candidate reconstruction. Um, and so we once again do that via an iterative scheme. So that's just exactly what we were doing on the previous slide. We're holding constant the segmentation and updating the reconstruction. And then we're holding constant the reconstruction and updating the segmentation. And then one thing that can be slightly tidied up with this um, scheme is that it turns out that the Ginsburg-Landau energy is linear in your edge weights. Um, which you can just about see if you look at this um, expression, though it's a little bit hidden by these degree terms that are turning up. Um, but that means that we can rewrite this in a little bit neater form um, like this. So this is, these are now the two equations that we need to solve. And so the, um, the next section of this talk is, an, is our algorithm for solving these minimization problems. So first, I'm going to have to go on a bit of a numerical linear algebra interlude because the matrices that we generate with these weight matrices are way too large to be worked with on a computer. So we need to compress them using numerical linear algebra tricks. Then I'm going to be talking about our methods for solving um, these equations 2a and 2b individually. And then finally, summarizing this all in the pipeline that is our algorithm. So first off, yeah. Um, this problem of the size of our matrices, the images that we might be working with, they might be megapixel images, they might be larger than megapixel images. So you've got a million pixels, that means you've got 10 to the 12 or more entries in your weight matrix, and these weight matrices are non-sparse in order to try and make the most of the non-localness of these methods, but it means that these are therefore vastly too large to store in memory. Um, let alone, you know, compute with. So the trick from, um, from Batozzi Flenner is to use what's called the Nystrom extension to compress these matrices. So what the Nystrom extension does is it takes us a matrix matrix A and it represents it via this following um, decomposition here. It can also be done for non-symmetric matrices, but the weight matrix is symmetric. So I'm just going to talk about that case. And where this expression comes from is that we've essentially used the eigen decomposition of just this um, submatrix in the top left, which is nice and small. 
And then we've extended the eigenvectors of that um, and eigenvalues of that um, sub, well, the, you're extending the eigenvectors and then you're only keeping the number of eigenvalues that are in that principal submatrix. And what we use to do that is essentially a quadrature rule. That was actually what Nystrom was using his method to do um, back in the 20s was to do integrals. And then in the early 2000s, it was figured out that you could do this for um, to compress matrices. And so what this gets you then is a low rank approximation of your um, big matrix here, just in, in this um, fairly easy to keep track of form. And then the only things that you ever have to compute are these submatrices AXX and AYX. And in fact, computing AYX is a little bit of a bottleneck of this method. And there's a paper by um, Batotsi in, I believe, 2017, which um, talks about using um, parallelization type methods in order to compute that much faster. Um, but I'm not going to talk about any of that here. So then the, the key thing that this nice extension lets you do is two things. One, it automatically lets you compute a fast approximation of matrix vector products just by first computing the matrix vector product with this thing here, then with this inverted small matrix, and then with this um, matrix on, on the left-hand side. And so you're never working with these full size matrices. You're always working with rank um, X matrices. Um, and then if we want the eigen decomposition, so I'd sort of said that your, you, the Nystrom extension extends the eigenvectors of the, the submatrix in the top left. However, when it does this extension, it doesn't actually make them um, orthonormal. So, there are some, so there's a nice trick that you can do in order to compute orthonormal um, matri um, eigen, an eigen decomposition of your matrix using the QR decomposition. So what you do is we started off with this nice from extension here, which I've just um, rewritten a little bit uh, slightly more compressively, but it's just the same, the same expression as we had um, here. And then what we first do is we take a QR decomposition of these matrices on the left and on the right. And then what that gives us in the middle is this matrix is this small matrix um, flanked on either side by Q and Q transpose. And we can compute an eigen decomposition of that matrix because it's small. And then we can just use these um, orthonormal matrices from the QR decomposition to then extend um, these eigenvectors of this small matrix to orthonormal eigenvectors of our whole matrix just by multiplying them by Q. And so then that gives this eigen decomposition that you see here, which is an approximate decomposition. It, it's all the approximation because it's a rank K. And then it's also a development approximation because it's not the best rank K approximation. There are, you know, there, there are some um, errors that are incurred by taking the Nystrom method. But the advantage is that this is, what, this is quite quick, that the, um, the most expensive thing that you're doing is things like this matrix multiplication here and this performing of the QR decomposition here, both of which are um, order, um, order n, n k squared. Where if k is the, is the small size of, of x and n is the large size, you know, 10 to the 6, the number of pixels that you have. So, so this, okay, so that's the, the end of this linear algebra interlude. The key takeaway from this is that we can compute um, matrix vector products and eigen and approximate eigen decompositions of these matrices, despite the fact that they are too large to store in memory if we were storing all of them. Okay, so with all of that under our belt, let's um, solve the minimization problems that we have so let's start off with 2A, so that is to say the reconstruction update problem. And so that's this, this energy here. And we can rewrite that energy in this form R plus J, where R is our convex regularizer, and J is a smooth non-convex term. And then we can solve that minimization problem using the IPRNA method of Ox et al. 
And so what that does is it does a gradient descent step in our smooth part of our energy and then does a proximal step in the convex part of our energy. And then there's, a, um, there's also a backtracking part of this algorithm, but I'm not getting into that here. OK, so then the difficult part of computing this method is computing this um, gradient here. Because once again, this energy is working with um, very, you know, these large matrices here that we can't store in memory. So we have to use the linear algebra tricks from the previous couple of slides in order to compute this um, gradient. And the way that we do that is via some fancy linear algebra tricks. So the first thing that we can do is we um, can write this energy here just by um, doing a bit of um, analysis and using the fact that we have a rather well-behaved um, weight um, function, where we had that radial basis function um, in our feature vectors, Z. And so that lets us write this gradient as the following expression here. And both of these terms are easy to compute. And the adjoint of our feature map is also easy to compute if we choose a nice, simple feature map. And so then the final bit that we need to compute is this uh, vector Q, which just corresponds to computing these matrix vector products with this matrix curly A. And what this matrix curly A comes from is it is the weight matrix Hadamard producted with this um, matrix which comes from the Ginsburg Landau energy. And when you actually stare at what this matrix GN is, you can just compute it in terms of the current segmentation and using the double well um, potential and from your um, fidelity terms and just sort of combining all of these terms together. And you get that the matrix can be written in this following form. And then finally, by just plugging this expression into suffix notation and rearranging, you can, you can compute these matrix vector products with this matrix A just in terms of these matrix vector products using the weight matrix. And then finally, we can compute matrix vector products with the weight matrix using the nice from decomposition of the weight matrix. So this then lets us approximately compute the gradient of our energy J, um, where the approximation will come in only in the computation of these blue terms via the nice from extension. Everything else is exact. It's just computing those matrix vector products, which causes this approximation to appear. However, there are some problems with this method for computing the, um, the minimizers of 2A. The first is that this proximal step can, um, can be quite slow um, when you combine it with all of the other stuff that's, that's going on. And another problem, however, is that computing this, um, this gradient takes a bit of time with doing all of these nice film steps. And also, the approximations can be large enough that you are no longer really doing a gradient descent and that the energy no longer decreases along these iterations xk. Um, so that's something to be, to be wary of when you're doing this method. So another method that we have looked at for, um, for solving 2A is to linearize it. So what we do is that we've got this term in the middle here, which is causing us all of our grief. And what we want to do then is to linearize that term around our previous reconstruction to get the following expression um, here. And then when we simplify 2a by suppressing all of the terms which don't depend on x, we get the following um, problem here. And then just to note that we can uh, compute this gradient of g by exactly the same methods as on the previous slide 
it's just this bit here where we don't have these other terms, but these other terms were the easy ones. Um, and then by a little bit of rearranging, we can write that minimization problem in the following form here. And so now, what is this minimization problem doing? First, we're taking our previous reconstruction and then we're using the current uh, segmentation to take a step down a gradient descent of the Ginsburg-Landau energy. So what that does is it increases the contrast between our different segments. So then that gives us this contrast adjusted reconstruction. And then finally, we throw that into a minimization problem that looks like this. But this is just a standard variational image reconstruction problem. And the nice thing is, all, because we only ever compute this gradient once when we do the linearization, we don't have this problem of errors in that approximation of the gradient compounding. And the other nice thing that we have now done is we can now solve this image reconstruction problem by whatever methods you are particularly fond of using. Because if we just make this um, change of notation, you can really see this is just in the standard you know, variational image reconstruction framework. OK, so that's how we update the reconstruction. How do we update the segmentation? Well, that turns out to be a little bit more straightforward. So we've got this energy um, that looks like this that we want to minimize. But the nice thing that happens is because the fidelity term in the Ginsburg-Landau energy only depends on the uh, training data, whilst the, um, the, this momentum term only uses the momentum uh, only compares to the previous segmentation on the non-training data pixels. That's what that's what this Z denotes. I'm not sure if I said that um, so far, but that's what this Z denotes. It denotes the, the pixels which are on the image that you want to reconstruct and segment. So these terms end up combining together quite um, neatly, and you just get this single Ginsburg-Landau energy that you need to minimize. Um, using these modified fidelity parameter and um, reference. And so what you can see actually that this reference is doing is it's using your a priori information on the training data and it's and using the previous segmentation on the test data. And the strength of your confidence in the previous segmentation is encoded by this parameter nu which is going to maybe is going to increase um, along the uh, the process of this method. So as you get more confident in your previous segmentation. So now we've just reduced this problem to minimizing a Ginsburg-Landau energy. And we talked about how to do that. We just need to iterate the SGIE scheme until convergence. But there's one thing to do in order to do this, which is that to compute the SGIE scheme, we need to be able to compute this force graph diffusion. So the way that we do that is that we, so we seek to compute this force diffusion operator S tau. And this splits into two different parts, one of which is a matrix exponential times by um, your initial state. So in this case, the initial state is going to um, be the previous state in the SDE scheme. So you're gonna start off with um, some initial segmentation and then you're going to update that with the SGIE scheme to get your Ginsburg-Landau minimizer. And each of these updates is just going to be um, computed by hitting the previous SGIE iterate with this solution operator and then thresholding. Um, and then this other term here, which doesn't actually depend on the state which the force diffusion is being applied to, it's just the force diffusion of the zero vector. So you only need to compute that once throughout the entire process of applying the SDIE scheme. So, so we need to compute these two different terms. Um, and then what we have, this matrix A that we're taking an exponential of, is split into two parts. One part is the graph of Fassian, 
And the other part is just the diagonal vector of our um, fidelity weights. Um, so the, the diagonal matrix with diagonal, the, um, the vector of, of our fidelity weights. So because our um, matrix is split up in these two forms, and we know how to do um, an, a decomposition of these two different things, then we're going to use the Strang formula in order to approximate that uh, matrix exponential. Um, so, we, so this gives us a scheme that looks like this for computing that matrix exponential. And then how do we compute the matrix exponential of the graph Laplacian term? The other term is just a diagonal matrix, so that's easy. Well, we can use this nice from QR method that we had before to get an eigen decomposition or approximate eigen decomposition of that um, graph Laplacian. And then that lets us compute the matrix exponential um, via the following expression. So then this just gives us a scheme for computing this term here. And this scheme turns out to be just as fast as an Euler scheme. But thanks to the Strang formula, you get an extra um, degree of accuracy for free. Um, in fact, it's actually slightly um, more accurate than the Euler scheme for, that was used in um, um, Mikhail of Kostik and Potosi for computing graph diffusion. And the reason why that is, is because of this slightly clever trick that I've done here, where I've subtracted the um, identity matrix on the inside here and added the identity um, on the outside. And that removes some of the error that we get by the fact that we have done a rank reduction so that we've thrown away some of our, our eigenvectors. Um, so that also gives us a little bit more accuracy. And then finally, we need to compute this term B. Here, we really haven't got anything better than um, an Euler scheme. If you read uh, the paper of, of myself and, and, and Yisman Genef and Jonas, um, that you will see that we tried a whole bunch of different um, ways of computing this B. And it turned out that the Euler scheme worked best um, for the applications that we were considering. But since we only need to compute this term once for an entire sequence of SDIE iterations, we can be a little bit um, more accurate. We can, you know, can choose a smaller time step in our Euler scheme if we need to for that application. And then we just compute the force diffusion of zero with that Euler scheme to get our term B. OK, and that is then how you compute this force graph diffusion. And that's all you need to be able to do to apply this SDIE scheme because the thresholding is just a, um, a straightforward um, element-wise operation. OK, so tying this all together, um, this is the pipeline. So we start off taking in as input the um, so our, our observations that we have and our training data um, image and our um, labeling of that training data image, as well as all of our parameter values. Then we perform a cheap reconstruction of our observations in order to get our initial uh, reconstruction. And we perform an MBO segmentation of that initial reconstruction to get our initial segmentation. And then we iterate 2A and 2B until we get convergence and we increase our um, momentum terms uh, to, to aid along getting to that convergence. And then once we've converged, we output our final reconstruction and our segmentation. OK, so finally, some, some examples on some actual images. So these are the images that we're going to be talking about for, for the rest of this talk. So these are the cows that were segmented in the original um, Batozzi papers, and so sort of become a little bit of a uh, benchmark in the literature. So our training data image is this image of these cows uh, lying down. And our test data image is this image of the cows standing up. And then we feed into our code also this segmentation of our training data image, um, which was drawn by hand by me. And if you look very closely, you'll actually see a tiny blob of white in the bottom left-hand corner. This was me accidentally uh, filling things out. And that got all the way through to the proofing stage in our paper before we noticed it. So there it is. Um, and then finally, we have this ground truth segmentation of our um, image, 
which is um, we then use to compute the accuracy of our um, compute the accuracy of our segmentation once we've got it, but the code doesn't see this ground truth. Um, I should actually say this this um, paper here was for a previous work that was just on image segmentation. In the examples that are to follow, this error in the bottom left hand corner has been fixed. Um, but so this is just a bit of a, a brief history of the segmentation of these cow images in the, um, the literature. So this is the original um, segmentation using Ginsburg-Landau methods in Potosi Falana 2012. And then this was the segmentation using MVO methods in their follow-up paper in 2013 um, by, by Makoto, Kostik, and Potosi. And then finally, this is our segmentation from um, from this year, using these extra ideas from you, this nice from QR technique and the strang formula technique for the force diffusion, and the accuracy that you get for this segmentation is about ninety eight point five um, percent, and this took about two and a half seconds to uh, to run. So this is the accuracy that you can get for segmenting this image if you don't have any noise or Maybe there's a little bit of noise, you know, in this in this picture quite na natively, but for a fairly low level level of noise, you're getting about 98.5% accuracy. Okay, this is then the image that we're going to be testing our method on, which so this is this highly noised um, version of these two cows, the signal to noise ratio of, of about 0.85. Um, and so we've chosen this fairly high noise level to be a really big stress test of our method of how well can you get on this image compared to that 98.5 that you can get when you're trying to just do this image without any noise. Um, OK, so this is a preliminary result. Um, so let me walk you through what this figure is, is showing you. So this is the initial reconstruction that we get for our image just by using an ROF method. Um, so using total variation denoising to denoise our image. And this is the initial segmentation you get when you just use um, our MBO method to segment this um, denoised image. I should say I've been, um, I'm using the MBO special case of the SGIE scheme for all of these examples for, um, for people who, who want that detail. Then, um, on the right here is the most accurate reconstruction that we get over the course of the joint reconstruction segmentation scheme. You can't tell by looking, but I promise this is slightly more accurate from than the uh, total variation um, denoising. If you really squint, you can see that the contrast is a little bit better between the cows and the um, non-cow parts of the image. And this is the best segmentation that we get about four iterations into our scheme. And it's about 94.9% um, accurate. Um, and that's a great improvement over the initial segmentation, which is only 84% um, accurate. And so you can see this is pretty good considering the level of noise that we, that we had at the beginning and even still have in our um, best reconstruction. And so this was using the full um, IPRNO scheme um, for the reconstruction update, um, not using the, the uh, linearization. That's the next slide. However, this bit in the middle shows that the, there is a little bit of a, a hiccup in this story, which is that although the, um, the reconstruction remains fairly stable for this parameter setup, though actually the reconstruction accuracy gets slightly worse. Um, the segmentation eventually manages to just tunnel through to the constant segmentation on the um, test data image, which is a very nice way of minimizing sort of the sort of Ginsburg-Landau energy, um, but is obviously not very useful for our, for, for the purposes of actually segment of segmenting. And what we suspect is going on here is that what is supposed to stop this from happening is the fidelity forcing that's coming from the training data image. But potentially over the course of the scheme, the edge weights between the 
um, training data image and the test data image are lowering enough that this is able to not be penalized sufficiently by the fidelity forcing terms. Um, and then the runtime for this on my not particularly good laptop was about three minutes per iteration. So it takes six minutes, took me six minutes to get to the best reconstruction and 12 minutes to get to the best segmentation. Okay, and then this is the same story, but now using the linearized scheme to update the um, reconstruction rather than the um, full IPiano scheme to update the reconstruction. And you can see there's a quite a bit more contrast in the reconstructed image, maybe a little bit too much contrast now in the reconstructed image. And that's because of this segmentation induced contrast that the, um, that the linearized, linearized scheme introduces. However, that contrast is quite useful for doing segmentation. And you can see and see that the segmentation um, that we get is a, about equally good as the segmentation that we got using the full scheme. Um, what you find is we're getting a little bit more of the cow using the linearized scheme, but also a little bit more of the of the grass gets included into the cow label. So the accurate the actual accuracy ends up being about the same. Um, and I should say then that this took so this took one minute um, per iteration, um, but this was using the Ipiano scheme to um, perform the minimization when we when we've reduced our problem all the way down to our standard variational image reconstruction problem. I still use the Ipiano scheme to find the minimizer of that because that was just the code I had lying around. But I'm sure that if you use some of the more standard um, codes for for doing that for solving that problem, you would get both a faster runtime and probably a more accurate reconstruction. Um, but that so that so these then are are our results. And then so what are sort of the challenges and potential improvements? So the challenge is this best reconstruction segmentation appears to be unstable. So you can see in both of these cases that the uh, we we got that constant at the end of our segmentation. Um, and actually, the reconstruction can also be quite unstable as well if you don't choose the right parameter setups, that the, um, this contrast just bleeds into the image and, and completely ruins everything. Um, evaluating this proximal step in the IPiano method is quite slow. Um, it's one of the major bottlenecks in using the, the full um, IPiano scheme. And it's sped up a bit using the linearized method, but it's still slow, um, which is why you should use the linearized method with a, a different solver, not using the IPiano solver. Um, and then as I talked a little bit about before, this inaccurate approximation of the gradient, which can lead to the reconstruction just not improving or even getting worse. Um, the linearized scheme is also um, can be problematic if you don't choose your parameters correctly, that this segmentation induced contrast is just way too much and actually causes the graph to disconnect. And that causes the scheme to, um, to break because you get these uh, zero eigenvalues in the graph of Lassian. And then you have lots of parameters to tune. Um, and that's, so that's sort of come up in what I've been mentioning before, where, where these parameters really matter, and there's quite a few of them. So that's a major challenge for using this in practice. And then so some potential improvements. Um, there are some methods using a non equal space fast Fourier transform from Alfka et al to compute matrix vector products with weight matrices that are generated by a kernel like a radial basis function. And so these um, fast, matrix, fast matrix vector product methods might be better than using the nicer method for the approximations we've been using. Um, we want to add some better ca capability for the parameters to self-adjust so that there was less of a tuning problem. And then there's also ideas to use some mini-batching or multi-scale methods to uh, reduce the size of the problem so that we don't have to lean so heavily on these numerical linear algebra methods. Um, so in summary, joint reconstruction segmentation performs both joint, both reconstruction and segmentation tasks together to lead to better reconstructions and segmentations. 
These graph-based segmentation methods can be incorporated into this framework with promising results, but there are still a lot to be figured out and it's early days for this method. Um, thank you for your time. Any questions?